Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2020. We have received apologies for today's meeting from our school hub. The first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation, consideration of two made affirmative instruments. The instruments we are looking at today are the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Scotland Amendment Regulations number 11 and the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Scotland Regulations Amendment number 12. Uh, these regulations are, as in previous weeks, uh, relating to coronavirus and international travel and are laid under Section 94.1 International Travel of the Public Health etc. Scotland Act 2008. The provisions of this Act mean that uh, the, uh, these regulations should be affirmative. However, Scottish ministers may uh, 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 consider that those regulations need to be made urgently and therefore bring them into force. Uh, but in that case, they must be laid before the Scottish Parliament and will cease to have effect on the expiry of the period of 28 days, beginning with the date in which the regulations were made, unless before the expiry of that period they have been approved by a resolution of the Parliament. And it is for the Health and Sport Committee to consider these instruments accordingly. We will have an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and with officials on the instruments. Uh, and once we have asked all our questions, we will have a formal debate on the motions. And I, I will propose uh, to take a single debate uh, uh, on, on, on the two motions before us. But in the meantime, I welcome to the committee Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice. He is accompanied today by Rachel Sunderland, Deputy Director, Population and Migration Division, Jamie McDougall, Deputy Director of Test and Protect Portfolio, and Anita Popplestone, Head of Police Complaints and Scrutiny. Uh, with the Cabinet Secretary's agreement, we will ask questions on both instruments together. Uh, can I start, uh, Cabinet Secretary, simply by asking you for an update on one of the areas of questioning we have uh, uh, had in front of the committee in previous weeks, and that's around the proposition of testing of passengers on arrival, particularly at airports. I wonder if you're able to bring us up to date, Cabinet Secretary, on any developments or any discussions there may have been uh, since we last discussed that matter. Come see you, sir. Good morning, Convener. I hope morning. you and all members of the committee are keeping well today. Uh, thank you, Convener. And uh, in terms of the update on airport testing, it was an issue that was again discussed in our Four Nations call last week. I have another Four Nations call, as you'd imagine, later uh, this week. The government remains concerned that the airport testing regimes posed at this stage are not as robust um, as a 14-day isolation or quarantine measure would be. So there is a proposal that has been suggested that we look at testing upon arrival and then testing again somewhere around day eight of somebody's isolation. The real concern with that proposal at the moment, convener, is that if you test negative on arrival, which will probably be the people arriving, then that would provide a false reassurance. And the chances of those individuals then going on to quarantine for uh, at least another eight to 10 days would be uh, extremely challenging because we know what people's behaviors are. And there's um, some data around people's behaviors if they test negative. So the systems that have been proposed thus far aren't as uh, effective as a 14-day isolation. That doesn't mean that we're not continuing to, propose, uh, to, to, to look at proposals that come forward from the airports. And I suspect it will be another uh, point of conversation at our Four Nations call. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I wonder if other members have questions. I see a question from Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Just a quick question, really. I'm just wondering why, uh, or is there a specific circumstance or particular uh, reasons that causes divergence in the Four Nations approach? For instance, that uh, maybe Scotland would exempt some countries, uh, uh, whereas Wales would not. 
Come, Mr. Secretary. Um, so um, ultimately, the reasons uh, would pertain to uh, our own data in relation to our own country. So I suppose this week, um, the regulations we're discussing are a good example of that. So, so we removed Greece um, unilaterally. Uh, the other nations um, at that point hadn't uh, removed Greece or any of the Greek islands. Um, they, they now have uh, removed uh, a number of Greek islands. But at the point when these regulations came into force, we took that decision because the public health Scotland data, so not the not the JBC data, not the, the public health England risk assessment, but the public health Scotland data showed a worrying level of imported cases coming from Greece. At the time I took the decision, the number of positive cases that were linked to travel from Greece was the second highest just behind Spain. Uh, the week after these regulations came into force, Greece overtook Spain. Uh, and I, uh, and the, the cases, the numbers that I have in front of me, uh, Greece continues to be the country that gives us the most concern uh, in relation to the importation of cases. So, um, th you know, a, a lot of people talk about alignment, and, and I think it is important, and, and where we can align, uh, we absolutely will. And in the majority of cases, we do tend to, to, to align. But equally, there's also an understanding of these four nations' call, calls that, that each country will end up taking a decision uh, based on, on on the interest of its own uh, country, uh, the population it serves. Uh, and... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think Emma's uh, uh, got the answer she wanted, and I'm now looking f uh, to Brian Whittle, who has a question. Brian Whittle. Hey. Thank you, Givina. Good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Just following on from Emma uh, Harper's question here, just as a point of clarification, are, uh, to the Scottish Government, are, are you getting different advice or have you set up as, as there different criteria in terms of, of uh, which countries uh, exempt and don't exempt? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure. I might have just um, uh, misheard the very last part of Brian Whittle's question, but I think I've got the gist of it. So, um, it, just as I said to, to, to Emma Harper, we get, um, th there is some data that's shared between the four nations. So, the Joint Biosecurity Centre data we receive mm -hmm. uh, is shared. The Public Health England assessment of, of countries is shared, which is helpful. But then we'll each individually look at our own data. So, I'll look, I, I will look at Public Health Scotland data in relation to the transmission of the virus. Uh, coming into the country. Um, so it's a range of data uh, that is used. Some of that is shared between the four nations. And some of that is very specific to Scotland, I'm sure very specific to England. I suppose a demonstration of that would be um, the decision taken around Greece. So we obviously took a decision around Greece to, to, to exempt the entire uh, country. Uh, sorry, to remove uh, Greece from the exemption um, so, and, and the entire country. Wales then took a decision to remove from the exemption uh, a number of islands. Uh, the UK government and Northern Irish government then took a decision to remove a number of islands, but they were some of the islands were different to the islands that Wales had removed. And then Wales had then uh, had now an expanded list of, of, of islands. So it really does depend on the data that people have and governments have in relation to their own country as well as the shared data. I hope that clarifies. That's helpful. Uh, Brian Whittle, please supplementary. Yes, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, for that, Cabinet Secretary. And my final question here would be around um, the sort of relationship with the other countries, as in the other countries uh, around Europe and, and further afield, uh, in terms of data we gather from them and, and their reflections on, on how, we, how we are dealing with their, uh, their issues. Cabinet Secretary. Ultimately, the reason we take decisions it has to be done on public health grounds. Um, mm -hmm. I understand, of course, there could be concerns around diplomatic relations. Um, there may be countries that are upset at a decision that we take. Um, but I think as long as we can justify, which I'm very confident we can, as long as we can justify the reasons and rationale for why we've taken a particular decision on public health grounds, I hope that other governments would understand that these decisions are are being done on no other basis than for public health. 
And in some respects, that's quite liberating. It means you don't really have to think about the politics. You don't have to think too much about other other, other matters that may well often be part of a consideration uh, of hours that we make. It is done purely on public health grounds, and so we will sometimes. It would be again, it would be it would be, be, be wrong to suggest that um, you know some governments um, uh, you know aren't upset. Uh, with the councillor core. Consular core uh, here in, in in Edinburgh and Scotland more widely, uh, and therefore we're always happy to engage and explain the reasons why we take certain decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move to agenda items three and four, which are the formal debates on the made affirmative on which we have just taken evidence. Are members content with a single debate covering both instruments together? I see that is agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a formal uh, 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 debate stage, and therefore, uh, in a moment, I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to move the motions. Uh, the, uh, the, there, there will be an opportunity for members to contribute to the debate, but not to ask further questions. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motions S5M22576 and S5M22619 in his own? Convener, uh, as, as always, uh, convener, as always, uh, looking at your packed agenda, I'm happy to waive my right uh, to speak to the motions, uh, having answered uh, a few questions. But I will move the motions, of course, and, and wish to move the motions uh, S five M two two five seven six and S five M two two six one nine in my name. Thank you very much. I now put a single question to members of the committee. Uh, the question is that motions S five M two two five seven six and S five. Pardon me. Before I do that, uh, I should ask if any members wish to contribute to the debate uh, before we move to a vote. I see no request for a. Uh, oh, no, I do see a request. Apologies, Brian Whittle. <laughs> Sorry, Kavina. I, I, I didn't. I didn't want to press the camera secretary. I know we are tight for time, but I think one of the things I would like to explore at some point is the way in the relationship with, with other, other countries, the way in which they gather data and how that's fed into us and how that we make that decision because I don't think it's, it's consistent across uh, across other countries and I think that uh, probably for another time. But I think that's probably something I'd, I'd, I'd quite like to, to discuss with the Cabinet Secretary at some point. Thank you very much. Are, are there other members who wish to contribute to the debate? If not, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, briefly to sum up and respond, and then we will move to the Cabinet Secretary. Just to say, Kamina, in, in response to, to, to Brian Whittle, uh, more than happy to have that discussion uh, at any point. Um, uh, we, you have pressed me previously, Convener, on Public Health Scotland publishing the data in relation to imported cases. Yeah. Uh, I should have said that I'm pleased to say that um, they will do that from the 23rd of September. Um, and so that will give you uh, some more detail around some of the data that we use in relation to the decisions that we make. Uh, I would also say, just to Brian Whittle, um, the data that we use to make decisions is owned by the UK government. Uh, the Scottish government and the Welsh government have written in quite strong terms to the UK government to suggest that that data is released. We don't own that data, and any influence he can bring to bear, uh, of course, would be greatly appreciated. But on our last Four Nations call, um, the UK government, I think, understood the strength of feeling from the Scottish government and Welsh government uh, around the release of the data, uh, and therefore I would hope we can get to a position relatively soon where the data that we use to make decisions on a Four Nations basis is in some way, or shape or form, put out into the public domain. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on these motions. I will therefore put a single question. The question is that motions S5M22576 and S5M22619 be approved. Are we all agreed? We are agreed uh, that therefore, uh, and we will report to Parliament accordingly. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for your attendance today, and we will now move on to the item of business. The fourth item on the agenda is the uh, uh, is a, a negative instrument to consider the one negative instrument, the National Health Service Free Prescriptions and Charges for Drugs and Appliances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2020. Uh, can I ask, first of all, if any members have any comments on these instruments?
I see no comments from members. Uh, the question, therefore, uh, is that the committee has agreed to make no recommendations in relation to. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. That is agreed. And we will now move on to the next item of uh, business on our agenda, which is uh, in relation to pre budget scrutiny, part of our ongoing process of scrutinising the budget. Uh, as, as usual, and as we have done for a number of years, scrutinising the budget for the next financial year in 2021-2022, but also in this uh, unique uh, and, and very different year, considering also the impact on health and social care of COVID-19 on the current financial year's uh, uh, budget uh, and, uh, of, of the Scottish Government and of those funded and supported by the Scottish Government. We are hearing from a number of relevant bodies before hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Health, and at this fourth uh, in the series of meetings, we have two panels this morning, uh, the first from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and the second from NHS Lothian. And I welcome to the committee Jane Grant, Chief Executive uh, of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and Mark White, Director of As is uh, uh, the usual practice in uh, online virtual meetings, uh, we, have, we will ask questions in a pre-arranged order. Uh, I will start with the first question. Uh, before uh, going uh, to each colleague in turn to ask questions, and I will then invite witnesses to this one. Can I uh, remind colleagues that we have two uh, uh, separate evidence sessions this morning, and therefore I would encourage members in asking questions to make them succinct, to combine questions where it's possible and convenient to do so, and I would ask that both questions and answers. Uh, be, be succinct in order to allow us to make good progress uh, through the range of issues we want to consider this morning. So, on that uh, basis, may I start and ask uh, Jane Grant and Mark White in relation to uh, the, the current financial year, whether it is your expectation that additional costs resulting from COVID-19 will be offset by reductions in expenditure elsewhere. If not, uh, what additional costs do you anticipate over the current financial year, and to what extent would you expect the Scottish Government to provide funding uh, to fill that gap? Jane Grant. Okay, good morning, Convener. Um, I'll, I'll start with some points, and then perhaps Mark could add some of the detail to that. Um, so, it, uh, we have been working closely with the Scottish Government to ensure that, that, that we have a, a good dialogue about what our additional costs are. We have had substantial additional costs. We have had assurance from the Scottish Government that they will support us in, in those additional costs. Um, they will continue throughout the year. We've clearly got issues about PPE, additional staffing and so on. <clears throat> and although some of those costs are being centrally funded, we do have some additional costs here. In addition to run um, some of the elective programme and so on, the, the throughput is, is not um, uh, at the level it was before, so therefore we are looking about how we can maximise the, the number of patients we're seeing, um, and also the continuation of red and green pathways clearly has some infection control processes. So we are working closely with the Scottish Government. We do expect that there will have to be some additional funding this year, and perhaps I'll pass over to Mark to talk about the detail of that. That's all right, convener. Mark White. Yes, thank you. Good morning, convener. Yeah, as, a, as the Chief Executive mentioned, we have been working closely with the Scottish Government. We have a, a, quite a detailed monitoring process put in place um, to, to record and, and, and to submit and, and, and monitor the, the additional costs of COVID. Um, yes, we are expecting significant additional costs due to, to the COVID outbreak. In the return we submitted to the committee uh, last month, we outlined that for the first quarter of this financial year, the cost to the health board themselves, well, to the health board itself, was just over £60 million. Pounds. Um, and to our related six uh, IGBs, it was around about £59 million. Pounds. That, that's for the first quarter. Um, and we have submitted that to the Scottish Government, and, and we do expect that, that to be covered. Um, going forward through the year, in terms of off offsets, um, there, there isn't very many. Um, clearly, 75 per cent of our, our costs are fixed, our, our staff costs, so, so we, are, you know, we, are, we, can, we continue to, to, to incur them throughout the whole outbreak and for the rest of the, the financial year. So, so we are anticipating the, the majority of COVID will be additionality, although there is minor elements of, of savings to be made. In 
terms of that process, the Scottish Government sought um, from every health board a return covering that first quarter. That was submitted um, 10 days ago. That is being analysed at the moment, uh, and funding allocations are due at the end of September. Um, that is quite a complicated process. There is clearly quite a, a lot of additional cost here, um, and that is being uh, assessed at the moment by the Scottish Government. Uh, and they are also uh, analysing the process for allocating those funds to health boards. As you know, the NRAC uh, formula is, is a normal process, but, uh, but it is quite a complex situation. So, so they are reviewing that at the moment. So, so I hope that answers uh, that question in, in the various th three elements. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it does clearly that review of the funding formula or the way in which these funds will is something that uh, will be of significance for boards across the country. I am no doubt we will seek to find out more about that in due course. Um, can I move on to the issue of COVID testing and uh, ask uh, Jane Grant whether there have been issues with meeting the demand for COVID-19 testing in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and if so, whether those uh, issues have been overcome? Jane Grant. Thank you, convener. So in terms of testing, um, there's various elements to testing. Clearly, there's the capacity for uh, staff and, and uh, the population to access tests, and then there's the processing of the tests, if I could call it that. So in terms of processing the tests, we have to, we have uh, adequate capacity within Greater Glasgow and Clyde to, to process the tests that are coming in at the moment. Um, we are supporting. Uh, some of the care home testing. At the moment, we've moved some of the care home testing back into the NHS labs to reduce the weights for, for care home testing um, through the alternative process of Lighthouse Labs. So we are in active dialogue with the Scottish Government at the moment and have uh, transferred a thousand tests this week um, over to the NHS lab to support the wider um, testing regime. Um, in terms of access to testing for the population, that is a wider issue than Greater Glasgow and Clyde, as you'll be aware. Um, but certainly, the, the, we are working closely with our IGB partners, our, par our health and social care partners, to ensure they have access to testing. And that hasn't been a huge issue for us at the moment. There have been, as you know, some glitches with the, the, the waiting time for test results. But certainly, within the NHS labs, there is adequate capacity in Glasgow and Clyde at the moment. Thank you very much. And can you tell me if you have any concerns regarding the availability of testing going forward? Clearly, there may be an increase in cases, and there will be other pressures on on your lab services, I guess, as well as on your general health services uh, as we yes. enter autumn and winter. And I wonder if you have any concerns, any particular concerns about that forward look. In terms of testing capacity within the lab processing part, we still have some additional capacity. Um, and we also have a plan B, shall we say, which we could on, add on additional capacity further should there be a further spike. And we're also working with the West of Scotland Board to see whether we can get some resilience across the West. So at the moment, we do have plans to be able to increase our capacity by a reasonable amount should there be um, additional uh, requirement. And we do have at the moment um, capacity as well. Thank you very much. And can I now call Emma Harper? Convener, good morning <clears throat> to you both. Um, uh, I am interested in some uh, questions around long-term implications of COVID-19, and uh, I am interested in pretty much. I'll just go straight to my questions uh, regarding the coronavirus pandemic and changes in service delivery that uh, that have been made. We know that health boards have given us information about changes. In the way they've approached their their service delivery, so um, can you help me understand what uh, what service delivery are likely to be retained once uh, once normal provision resumes? Jane Grant. Yeah, so as you've heard from colleagues, I think elsewhere we've moved uh, a lot of uh, services onto the digital um, near me facility. That's been very positive, and we've got good feedback from our patients. So we're looking at the moment to increase our, our near me capacity further. We're using it across um, both the acute sector and the partnerships um, to ensure that patients don't have to travel um, uh, as much as possible. There will be some patients who, who do need face-to-face -face appointments, but we're using near me telephone consultations and where appropriate face-to-face. Um, -face. We have also set up acute phlebotomy hubs where 
because quite a lot of the outpatient activity requires phlebotomy and blood tests, and therefore we have set up um, on, on a number of acute sites at the moment the ability for patients to come safely and have their bloods taken so they can then have a virtual consultation, and that's working well. And we're planning to look at how we might uh, we might move that into the community um, in the fullness of time, but we want to do it quickly. So that has now been established as working well, and we will retain that. We are also looking at things like alternatives to endoscopy, because as you'll be aware, it's an aerosol generating procedure, and that's been difficult for us in some of the in some of the endoscopy setups. So we're looking at alternatives like capsule endoscopy and cytosponge that uh, we're working closely with the Scottish Government and those alternatives. Um, which will, will provide additional options for patients um, going forward. We have also established things like the mental health assessment units, where people um, have gone directly to them. There are two within Greater Glasgow and Clyde at the moment, and we are looking at the, the continuation of them. We have also got things like virtual visiting, which has been uh, very positive for patients where, um, where they cannot have the same amount of visitors. So There is quite a lot of different things going on, which we would hope to retain. Um, going forward to assist in the, in the new processes at the moment. Emma Harper. And the, all the changes that you've described have they um, required additional funding? Um, and do you think that that uh, will require like a additional uh, input uh, for funding in the future? Grant. So a, a number of um, so the. Sorry, convener. The, a number of them we can we can uh, re, uh, move some of our, our resources at the moment. Some of them will require additional funding if we want them to be completely separate entities. And what we're trying to do at the moment is review where we can have substitution for service provision and where we need additional funding. And there will be some. However, we are hopeful that there is a capital investment, as you'll be aware, for things like um, virtual visiting and for near me. But actually, in the fullness of time, we think that that will be a, a, able to, to utilise some of our resources in a different way. So there will undoubtedly be some additionality, but actually, um, that we think that we can uh, fund some of them within the resources we've got as well. Emma. And um, just a, a final question. Uh, last week, I, I asked questions about shifting the balance of care, and we know that the, the goal would be to have care provided more in community rather than in acute care settings. So, would the changes that you're describing help support shifting the balance of care from hospital to community settings? Ben Grant. Well, certainly, certainly, issues like you know us moving the phlebotomy hubs out into the community. We've been working very closely with our health and social care partnerships over this um, time, and we've a very good whole system working approach. They have been looking at how to augment their services in the community, and also with the, the care home liaison service to make sure that we, the health service and our IGB colleagues. Um, and also the council colleagues are working together to make sure that uh, where appropriate patients can remain in their home, where that is the best place for them to be. And a final question from Emma Hark. Thank you. Um, just whether there's been uh, any impact on the set aside budget, whether you expect any impact on that. Mark White. So the, the, oh, the, Sorry, um, Sorry. The, the current setup. We haven't got to the, the that level of detail at the moment. The emergency flow is obviously um, not in its normal state at the moment. So, from that point of view, there will have to be some um, review of the whole emergency patient flow. Um, but I'll maybe turn to Mark to give some detail in the set aside budget, if that's all right. Mark. Mark. Yeah, I think that the, 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 it's a very good question, and, and, and ultimately, yes, we would hope that there will be an impact in the set aside budget. I think at the moment it's it's just a bit too early to tell, um, and and uh, at the moment it, with, with the complexities around the current set position with the community, with the provision of services in the community, it, it's 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 probably too difficult to tell to measure that. But I think longer term, the answer would probably be that we would hope it would, um, and certainly when things settle down, we will revisit that set aside process. Um, and be able to, to work that through and, and come up with a definitive answer. Thank you very much. And I call George Lally. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I would just like to ask about integration. 
you know, and how we've dealt with it during uh, the pandemic. You know, my main questions would be, what lessons have we learned during the pandemic regards integration? And has the promise of integration been realised during the pandemic? And what were the key challenges? Ian Grant. So we have a, a good working relationship with our six IGBs and partnerships within Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, and as part of that, we set up a strategic executive group where we have two of the chief officers as key members of that. All of our six chief officers are part of our corporate management team. But what I would say in answer to your question is that we have augmented that whole system working um, within the last six months. We have the, the health and social care partnerships have a tactical group which feeds into the strategic executive group. And we've been able to do um, a lot of work very swiftly. And where issues have been raised at the tactical group, then they have gone up to the strategic executive group for for, uh, for support, and we've been able to do decision making in a whole system way in a, in, a, in a much more swift way than we would have in, in, in previous times. In terms of integration, um, clearly emergency pathways require the whole system to, to work um, in tandem, and therefore it is important that we have a, a good understanding of that whole patient flow and the whole patient pathway. And integration, I think, has supported that over the last uh, six months. Before that, as well, but certainly in the last six months, we've been able to have a lot of work done. I mean, and, and as part of some of that, you'll have seen the examples around care homes and, and the fact that we have we have all worked in a different way around care homes than we had previously. So, we've also um, augmented that with a regular dialogue on a frequent basis with myself and the six local authority chief executives. So that we all have an understanding of our, our uh, key issues across the system. But I think it is working well. It is, it is uh, complex when you have six uh, health and social care partnerships, but I think the liaison processes we've put in place have helped us and supported that process. Georgia. I understand, uh, Jane, the, the challenges that you face with having so many uh, IGBs and local authorities to partners to work with. But one of the things that always amazes me is we've been talking about this for years, the integration of health and social care. And now we seem to be hearing from yourself and some of your colleagues and other boards effectively that it's taken a worldwide pandemic for us to get to a stage where people are actually talking to one another, breaking down these barriers and uh, actually dealing with it. Why would that be the case? Why couldn't we have gotten to this place before we ended up in this emergency situation? So I think I think certainly within Greater Glasgow and Clyde we have had good whole system working up until now. We do have a regular dialogue with our partnerships. We do have, as I say, the chief officers as part of our corporate management team. The six chief officers attend the NHS board meetings. So so we do have a good dialogue with them already. I think like everything, when, when a pandemic comes, um, then you have to do things that very swiftly um, because there is an emergency situation. And you're right, we need to reflect on whether some of those issues could have been dealt with more swiftly. But that applies across the piece, of, I think, on a lot of issues. And we do have lessons to learn about um, the processes and how we actually engage with six partnerships in a, in, a, in a coordinated way to make the processes and decision-making processes slicker. That, that does require, and, and the legislation requires us to have whole system plans across Glasgow and Clyde, and that certainly is something that we'll be progressing um, over the next wee while in a, in a very positive and uh, integrated way across all of the partnerships and the health board, and clearly other organisations as well. Georgia, can you you keep talking about uh, the you've all augmented your processes and uh, you're dealing with things swiftly. You found ways to cut out effectively red tape and be able to communicate with one another, which is the number one uh, issue and challenge that you face. Can you give me an actual practical example of something that you do differently now that you didn't do previously? Jim Grant. Well, if you look, if you look at the flu vaccination plan we've been working on across the whole system, so our public health colleagues have been working with the partnerships because we do have a, a significantly greater flu vaccination issue this year than we've had before. So we have uh, used the, some of the corporate resource, we've used some of the the public health resource, and we've used the chief officers and the partnership resource to actually make sure we've got an integrated flu vaccination plan. We've also um, set up uh, established care home 
uh, and a number of different approaches to care homes with our Director of Nursing, with our Director of Public Health, and with college and partnerships, and our integrated groups across Glasgow and Clyde looking at the issues that are arising in care homes every day and making sure that we have got a coordinated approach across the board to those issues. So those are a couple of examples where I think there are significantly different approaches than there had been before. Georgia. Okay, thank you, Kavina. One final question is, uh, has the experience of the pandemic, I think it obviously has, but highlighted any areas of improvements in the structures that you have? Uh, has the experience of the pandemic, I think it obviously has, but highlighted any areas of improvements in the structures that you have in place for decision making and allocation of resources, and allocation of resources in particular? And also, you know, will these structures remain in place when you are no longer dealing with the pandemic? Good God. So we have looked at, as I have explained, we have got a strategic executive group that is meeting uh, three times a week twice a week on, on what I would call ordinary business and once a week on remobilisation. And as part of that, it is our intention to retain that um, and make sure that the, the positive aspects of that um, are retained so as we can be fleet of foot around making decisions. In terms of resource allocation, things are coming there for consideration um, to make sure that we have got that integrated approach with chief officers, our acute colleagues and corporate colleagues on, on those uh, groups. And underneath that, we have got uh, a tact three tactical groups: one for partnerships, one for acute, and one for remobilisation. And for the certainly foreseeable future, they will remain work to the corporate management team in making those decisions. And there are resource implications and cases go there for consideration before any of significance come to the corporate management team. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much. I now call Brian Whittle. Uh, good, good morning, Jane. I, I'm looking uh, specifically around what assessment perhaps has been made for those indirect health, uh, the impact, the indirect impacts of, of COVID-19, uh, specifically around lockdown. Uh, I think all of us have been contacted by a number of different constituents around problems with mental health, or chronic pain, or, or, or diabetes clinics, or cancer screening, heart. You know, they've even had venous thrombolomalism. I didn't see it. And um, all those issues where uh, the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown and the way in which NHS have had to, to deal with that uh, basically pushed those those uh, those issues further down down the list. So, have you made an assessment of, of, of how that the, the potential pressure because they, they in the end will have to be treat, treated how that how that pressure on the NHS is coming down the down the line? Has an assessment been made of that? Yes, there has on a number of issues, um, and what we're looking at is a, as a, a national prioritisation process where patients are, are prioritised on their clinical need, and that is prioritised by our clinicians. So they are they uh, you know for patients who require emergency care, and then patients who require less urgent care, and, and a process of clinical prioritisation um, is is underway. Um, clearly, that, that will take some time <clears throat> to, to clear off backlogs and, and so on. We have had some consideration around mental health as well, and we have, a, uh, we, we have got additional sessions running to make sure that some of the backlogs we do have um, are, are being addressed. So, we, we have got a comprehensive remobilisation plan, which describes how we are going to try and uh, um, increase the, the, the number of patients we see in the shorter term. to, to to uh, reduce those backlogs. Right. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I think one of, a couple of the issues that have really been highlighted consistently around things like you know chronic pain clinics and the impact of the quality of life um, even has you know even has uh, an impact on on you know length of life. Uh, things like cancer screening, how that the, the, we know that the number of cancer screens went down significantly, and that has to have an impact coming down the line. So. I think one of the questions I'd really like to ask you is, is if you think the lockdown struck the right balance in between minimising those potential uh, indirect health impacts with the obvious direct health impacts of COVID. Jane Grant. I think it's it, it's difficult to strike that right balance um, in mm -hmm. terms of we we acted in coordination with other boards in on the information that was available to us throughout this pandemic, and we were all learning and. Uh, 
And uh, I think that balance is a difficult one to strike. What I would say is we recognise things like chronic pain is, is, a, is a priority and have uh, put some effort into making sure that we have a recovery plan to get those patients seen quickly. There, there are a lot of patients um, throughout our whole um, organisation who, who do require um, more urgent care, and we have to prioritise those, which, which, and we're trying to do that at the moment. In terms of cancer screening, it is a difficult one because we have had to utilise um, our resources in, in a in a different way because of the number of patients we've got who are urgent. So um, we, we will uh, augment our uh, cancer screening processes going forward, but I don't think there's a, an easy answer to your question, I'm afraid. Um, we have to balance the resource we've got with, the, with, with our ability to, to manage all of those areas. Uh, again, I, I totally recognise the, the, the issues you have, and I think one of the, the one of the things we need to consider is how we how we manage the expectation uh, of patients going forward. I mean, linked to chronic pains, obviously things like elective surgery and hip and knee replacements. We know how how the positive impact that can have on people's lives, um, and if we don't get that elective surgery, the negative impact and further pressure that puts in the NHS going forward. So I think. You know, finally, if I could ask a, a couple of questions here, uh, Kavina, the impact of COVID-19, what, what, what is that impact continuing to have on your service capacity? And, the, and, your other, and, and is there a current estimate of time scale for recovery to pre, pre-COVID uh, performance, or, or will we ever get back to pre-COVID uh, levels of performance, especially around things like uh, elective surgery? Jim Grant. So I think we, we have made some commitments in our re- uh, remobilisation plan to to return to 80% of our outpatient activity at the end of the year and uh, from last year, and also to recover to, to return to approximately 60% of our um, inpatient day case capacity by the autumn. Um, there are a number of processes, as you as you'll be aware, that have to be put in place to make sure the patient pathways are safe, and that does require us to to to, to um, maximise the, the the productivity, but also make sure that all of the processes are are safe for patients, and that does that will reduce the number of patients we can see through a session, etc. What we are doing, as I've explained, is, is looking at near me and virtual technologies for the outpatient part and trying to maximise that, and that has had a positive feedback. So um, we're putting quite a lot of effort into that to make sure that patients who are able, because not everyone is, it doesn't suit every patient, and we need to be person-centred and make sure that for those who can uh, support, uh, access that kind of arrangement, and that, and that will help us to get to, to get through some of the backlogs. Um, in terms of inpatient day case, it's more complicated along with endoscopy, but we are uh, we are doing additional sessions to try and reduce those backlogs on a clinical on a clinically prioritised basis. Um, in terms of your question about going back to where where we ever get back to our level of uh, throughput, I, th- I think that remains to be seen, and it depends, I think, going forward on some of the issues around infection control and so on. And uh, it will certainly take us some time to get back to the level of performance we were um, prior to uh, COVID. Thank you. Thank you. I now call David Thomas. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. How has the demand on hospices been affected by the pandemic? Jane Grant. So, in terms of hospices, we have been working closely with them to try and uh, support them, and there has been some resource given to, to them to support them. We work closely with them, and we have used their services, but it is an area that we have got further work to do, I think, in terms of going forward. Um, but certainly, hospices are, are high, a high part of our agenda. They work well with us, and the partnerships have a close liaison with them. David Collins. Is it anticipated that following a reduction of the planned care and diagnostic testing during the pandemic, future demand for hospitals will increase? If so, how will this be funded? Jim Grant. I'm afraid I didn't hear that question. So, could you repeat it? What the demand for hospices would be? Is that what you said? Yes, an increased demand, and how will this be funded? So, I'm not sure we've we've actually looked at that in detail. It is a good point, and how we how we um, go forward with the planning for hospices. We, we have been working closely with them, but in terms of the planned care and so on, I, I don't think that impact has really been assessed carefully at the moment. Um, and it may be that in due course we have to augment the, the hospice funding. But I'll pass over to Mark just to give you some of the detail about how we fund hospices. 
Park Park. Yeah, yeah, in response to the to the question, the for over 4.2 million pounds has already been received from the Scottish Government and passed to hospices. That was kind of almost at the, the start to the sort of uh, the escalation of the pandemic back in April and May. So, so we have allocated some funding, and, the, and I've no doubt there will be more. Um, the model of funding hospices is very complex. Many of it is is, is is different across various hospices, with some funding from ourselves, some funding from the Scottish Government Direct and, and the hospices themselves. So, as the Chief Exec mentioned, it's an area we will have to review much more closely um, and, and assess that in the, in the whole. I was going to say post post COVID world, but you know the, the new world that we're about to go into in the next six to twelve months around all our funding, um, uh, considering that we, we always have to be ready for 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 a second spike or, or further spikes. David Thomas. And my final question, convener: What other services commissioned by the IGBs have received increased funding as a result of the pandemic, and is it anticipated that extra funding will be needed to continue? Jim Grant. Um, yes, there, there, there has been uh, additional funding to, to um, health and social care partnerships, but I maybe we could pass that to Mark, who's got the detailed knowledge of that. Mark Park. Yeah, there's, it's back to my point. The, 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 the tranche of funding that the, the IGBs have, have received directly so far has been that, that element for hospices I mentioned. There's also been just over two million pounds allocated to, to, to fund the living wage. Um, and there's been a, another tranche of 11 million pounds uh, handed to, to, to integration authorities, which was pretty much a part payment for some of the, the external services they provide. Uh, sorry, they purchase um, to keep some of those organisations sustainable. Um, there's also been an allocation straight to GPs that again came sort of at the start of the pandemic. So all in all, through through NHS Glasgow and Clyde to our six IGBs, has been just over 20 million allocated so far. As I mentioned, the IGB has, has also um, submitted that first quarter return, which, which I alluded to at the start, um, and, and that, that includes around about 140 million of, of spend for the whole year for our six IGBs. And as I mentioned, that is currently in the, the process of analysis at the Scottish Government, and hopefully will form part of the settlement that we're, that we're expecting at, at the end of September. Thank you very much. Can I now call Sandra White? Very much, convener. Uh, good morning, Jane, and good morning, Mark. I wanted to push a little bit more on the retaining of innovations. I know that you answered to Emma Harper in regards to retaining virtual visiting, namely, and mental health uh, aspects as well. Uh, basically, what I wanted to ask is, well, you say you're going to hopefully retain them, these two that I've mentioned, are there any other innovations that you've adopted during lockdown, particularly in digital, which will be extended apart from these? Do you have any other ideas in that respect? So certainly the, the near me, and I, I won't rehearse that again because I've, 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 I've updated you already, but certainly there is a huge potential in near me to, to actually maximise that across all of our specialties, across mental health and across some of our EHP services. So there is yet quite a lot of potential to maximise there, which we, we are in the process of doing, but have not completed, and that will continue. Um, in terms of um, some of the other remote monitoring processes, we certainly would want to augment them. We have done a little of that, but we have got much to do around that arena as well, and that has been generally positively received by patients. Um, we have used things like uh, Consultant Connect as well, which is a, a direct uh, Process whereby GPs can talk directly to consultants within the hospital, and that has has proven to be a positive uh, direct access route for for GPs and, and primary care colleagues, and that will continue and be augmented as well. So there's a number of of areas. We've also used MS Teams as as uh, um, a process for for doing all of our uh, meetings and so on, and that uh, has been a little challenging at the beginning, but we're now well into the way of that, and uh, we're using that routinely. So there's a lot of areas where we use digital, and and we are we, we are down a route on digital, but there is much more to be to be done, and we are absolutely committed to doing that, and see that as certainly one of the key cornerstones of our future service provision. Thank, thank you very much for that, Jean. Uh, in regards to you mentioned the fact about digital being a bit difficult, uh, we have came across that uh, before of connections. Um, you mentioned you're going to scale up. In digital in the future, uh, has there been any barriers such as you know infrastructure which has stopped you from being able to go forward with the digital aspects 
of innovation which I've just mentioned and others. So our e-health team within the health board are very proactive and very forward-looking and have certainly uh, managed to overcome a, a number of barriers. Um, and, and undoubtedly, we will need to, to provide more resource for them if we want to move into that uh, in increasing digital world. Um, however, they have, they have managed to overcome the technical, technical challenges to date. Um, and, and also, we have to be cognizant of that there is a cohort of patients where these digital uh, channels won't, won't be bet we will, they will not be best placed for those patients. So we are working on uh, um, ensuring that we don't assume that, that that suits everyone because it won't. And so we have been working with our local authority and our colleagues and our chief officers around digital exclusion and making sure that we've, we're, we're looking at that aspect of the whole digital agenda as well. But our e-health colleagues up until now have done an outstanding job in supporting the, the board and its work. Thank you. Uh, just, to, just to follow on from that one, Jane, in regards to, the, I think it was a recent board paper which you produced, it mentioned that a review and evaluation of uh, the, the service models would ensure patient experience is maximised. Is that what you're meaning by evaluation, where you'll be asking patients how they felt about the digital innovations and how good it was in the experience for them? Yeah, right. Absolutely, because it's very important that we, we actually don't assume that one size fits all, and if there are challenges for the digital agenda, that we are um, addressing those as we go forward. Um, and that's why we're doing patient feedback, we're doing some surveys and so on, and we're asking people to, to give us their views. So far, the, the feedback has been positive, but as I say, it won't suit everybody, so we need to make sure that uh, we have got those patient and service user uh, views incorporated in our, in our uh, vision going forward. Thank you very much. And, and the report it would be in the, the board minutes, and obviously the committee will be able to see what the evaluation feedback is. Yep. In due course, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, Convener, can I just clarify? I have a couple other questions. Will I wait till uh, someone else comes in? No, Adam? you go on. The remaining oh. questions, please. Okay. I have to. I have to scroll down. I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's oh, the way the right. paper is. Has the been best produced. Have been kept in oh, absolutely. I'm sorry about that. Uh, witnesses as well in regard to that. Uh, some of the questions that I was going to ask have been answered, but this is about the resource implications uh, of COVID-19. And uh, first question, I think, is quite pointed, really, straight to the point. Uh, what is the latest estimate of the additional costs for NHS Glasgow Clyde Health and Social Care partnerships? resulting from COVID-19. I think Mark gave a slight indication to one of the convener's first questions, but maybe follow up from that one. Mark White. That's probably which is what costs are we incurred to date and then what costs are we projecting for, for the remainder yes, of the I year. And in the submission that we gave to the to the committee, which is probably the most accurate uh, assessment we have at the moment, took, took account of the first quarter, so that was April, May, and June. Bearing in mind that was at the peak of the pandemic, uh, and for the health board itself, there was an additional cost of 61 million um, for that period, and for our six IGB colleagues, there was an additional cost of 60 million in that period. So that's up to the first quarter um, in total. Um, and this is for, for covering the whole financial year, so from, from 1st of April straight through to 31st of March next year. Um, the projection for the health board itself is, is 190 million of, of additional costs, and that includes remobilisation as well as COVID. Uh, and for our IGBs, they've got a total cost of 144 million. Um, and again, that's COVID and, and remobilisation. Now, within that, um, because of the, of, the, of the financial situation in Glasgow, a large part of that is our unachieved savings. For Glasgow, that figures around about 70 million. So, so that, that that is is the opportunity cost, if you like, of, of spending our time delivering COVID services uh, and, and our, our focus on immobilisation rather than saving money, which is is normally um, front and centre of our day to day business. Um, and, but we are getting back to that, so we do expect that number to come down. So so that's the totality. As I mentioned, that's currently in negotiation with the Scottish Government about about supporting that. Sandra White. Thank you, Kevin. A huge, huge amounts of money in, in that respect. Um, has there been any reduced expenditure in, say, in the medical supplies? Will you be able to save? Will you be able to save any monies in that respect? Yeah, yeah. 
So, so yes, there has been minor offsets. Um, clearly, our elective programme is uh, through April and May was was greatly reduced. However, it's, it's picking up again. Um, and unfortunately, anyway, we are finding offsets and, and reduced areas of spend are, are well um, overtaken and superseded by by additional areas of cost. So, so yes, there are areas where we where we are we are spending less money. I think the challenge in that is also twofold in that how can we realise that at the moment? So some of that is temporary. If you take, for example, our, our repairs and maintenance bill for the whole twelve months, clearly through April and May we had uh, we had hardly anyone on site for uh, fixing things, external contractors, etc. But again, we'll have to accelerate that in the remaining seven eight months of the year to catch back up on that. So, so yes. The finances are telling us we didn't spend money in certain areas through April and May, but but we can't we can't realise that because we'll have to catch back up. So thank, thank you, Convener. So basically, whilst you may have saved on other other areas, really you have not saved at all. There will be extra expenditure, as you pointed out to us, in the coming months in regards to the budget. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, and that, and that is at, at current levels. I mean, clearly within those numbers, um, we have been a, a, a range of assumptions. Um, at the moment, we're assuming uh, that uh, we may have to again increase our intensive care ca capability to the levels we had back in April and May. That's that's hopefully will not happen. So, so some of those assumptions will not materialise. However, that, that with, with the information we have at the moment, those are those are our projections. Uh, that's the last question, convener, and I thank the panel very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call Donald Cameron? Can we uh, make sure Mr. Cameron's microphone is on, please? No, we're still not quite there. Um, oh, that sounds promising. No. No, well, I'll tell you what, we will go now to David Stewart and we'll come back to Mr. Cameron. David Stewart. Have a few questions about delayed discharge. Um, would the witnesses agree with the Lessons Learned report that during the pandemic, and I quote, medical staff were leaving social decisions to social care teams? And was it this aspect which led to a reduction in delayed discharge? Jim Grant. So certainly, uh, we have reviewed our processes for delayed discharge to make sure the dialogue between our clinical staff and the social care staff, social workers, um, ha has been uh, augmented. Uh, we have got a, a revised process in place, um, and I think that there does require to be good communication between uh, social workers and, and ward staff, both nursing and medical staff. And I think that that has a uh, the dynamic has improved during the process, and we are very keen to, to continue with that and augment it further and make sure there is one uh, process across Glasgow and Clyde, and the six partnerships are working on that just now with a view to having one process across Glasgow and Clyde where there were different processes before. So that's one of the changes we've made. David Stewart. Could I thank Jane Grant for her um, contribution there. Could you um, talk the committee through the number of beds occupied per day due to delayed discharge in March to July period? Um, as you will know, there was less of a marked reduction than other health boards in Scotland. Why was that? Jane <laughs> Grant. Yeah. So, so we did see um, a reduction in our in our uh, delayed discharges. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and that reduced quite quite by a reasonable amount. Um, and then what happened was that has uh, has risen a little. So at the beginning we had um, about 170 people, just approximately that, in March. That reduced uh, down to, to to substantially less than that, and it, it's now climbing a little again. And some of the issues around that are about uh, AWI patients and they're, they're able to to get through the adults with incapacity and. Um, Patients. Mm -hmm. Some of it is about their ability to to work with families because we're very keen to support them, and there has been uh, some some issues with that. Um, and also making sure that we we have the the correct processes in place for testing and so on. So there has been some complexity around that, but we are working hard to, to ensure that the the patients um, are placed in the right place for them at the right time, and that where they don't require to be in an acute bed, that they are they are uh, 
moved in an appropriate and balanced way. David Stewart. Um, how can sustained levels? Um, how, sorry, how can reduced uh, d d delayed discharge levels be sustained moving forward? I mean, is ingrained behaviour as important as finance? In Grant. So, so the issues within Glasgow and Clyde haven't been principally around finance. They they have been about mm -hmm. process. They have been about um, AWI, which has been a difficulty for us. They have been mm -hmm. about having family dialogues. Um, and, and we need to make sure we have those constructive conversations with families um, at the right time, because we do want to be person-centred and make sure that uh, families do have a, a, the ability to influence what's happening. And so, therefore, there has been dialogue around that, but it has got to be in a, in a focused way to make sure that patients aren't sitting too long in the acute sector when it doesn't suit their needs. And so, we do have um, work to do in that, and it has been an issue for Glasgow and Clyde for some time, and we're working closely with our partnerships to, to ensure that that dialogue takes place with a, within each ward environment. David Stewart. Um, thanks, Camille. My, my final question is: Have you assessed the cost benefits of reduced reducing delayed discharge in, in the long term? Jim Grant. So I'll, I'll answer the first part, and then maybe Mark could could augment that. So certainly, our primary focus has been where, where is the best location for patients to, to be uh, to be treated, and certainly mm -hmm. um, we would start with the where, where appropriate care at home is the best thing for patients, um, and only where that isn't possible would we consider kind of care homes and so on. And that's a, a discussion with our, our part, health and social care partnerships, because clearly, if patients and, and the population can be supported in their own home, then that is mostly the best place for them. However, there have been occasions where that, that, where that isn't possible, they, they go into care homes. Those, uh, that, that level of care is, is uh, um, less expensive than, than the acute sector, clearly, but, but that hasn't, that finance hasn't been our primary over, overarching process here. It has been what, where is the best place for patients to be treated um, uh, in conjunction with their families. But I think Mark might want to just talk a little of the detail of your question, if that's all right. Quite. Yeah, it, 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 as you said, it's quite a complex process. We always assess our, the, the process of delayed discharge is, is, is much more than the money. It's, it's what's best for our patients, and clearly, acute settings are, are, are not always uh, that, that the answer. Um, the, the general thinking around the health economy is that, that, that uh, the, the home setting, the community setting, is normally anything up to a quarter. Of the cost of, of an acute setting, keeping a patient in, and that can be even less in the home. Now, with, co with the COVID world and, and post-COVID, that those numbers will probably change slightly, um, but probably not not greatly. So, so for us, the process of moving people out into the community setting and reducing our discharge will always be um, the cost beneficial. But as I mentioned, there's a, there's a huge range of other factors, non-financial, to be uh, uh, included in that in that calculation. Thank you very much. Can I now uh, can I now call George Adam? Thank you, convener. I think you took us all by surprise there. Uh, uh, basically, I'd like to ask uh, the question with regards to primary care uh, with Greater Glasgow Clyde NHS. And, uh, the, the committee took a, a real interest in this last year with a. Major inquiry to, uh, did uh, undertook on primary care, and obviously things will have changed during the pandemic itself. And my first question would be: uh, How much additional funding was paid to GPs to compensate for remaining open during public holidays, and the additional costs such as deep cleaning and PPE? So, how much was paid to GPs to compensate for uh, opening during public holidays? And the additional costs of having to deal with the current situation in the pandemic. Uh, Mark White. Well, as I mentioned, I think at the start of the meeting, four million pounds was was allocated through NHS Glasgow to the GPs. Um, now, the specifics of, of how that was spent, and or, or indeed what that was to, to cover, is is maybe not uh, is transparent uh, or, or clear. Clearly, they're independent contractors, so, so, so the funding is, is given out, and then it's, uh, it will be offset against uh, what each GP sees as, as being relevant. In terms of PPE, 
uh, the, the majority of PPE that was given to GPs uh, and indeed all independent contractors was, was came from the Scottish Government. Um, uh, and uh, that was, I was going to say free of charge, but, it, but the, the, the independent contractors were not charged for that. Um, sometimes at the beginning of the pandemic, some of those independent contractors did purchase their own PPE to, to, to get them through that the initial those initial pro hurdles. But but following that, it was it, it came through from the Scottish government. So 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 far to recap, four million pounds has come through NHS Glasgow to our GPs, um, and and invariably, as I mentioned before, in the, in the funding settlement that's to come at the end of September, there will be more. George. Sure, Thank you for that answer, Mark. See, that was one of the concerns that came up uh, for the committee during the inquiry we had last year, was that the, the specific role of uh, GPs as outside contractors, because most, most of the public don't know their subcontractors uh, uh, with regard to, they assume they're part of the NHS. And what we found concerning then, and we still find, I would say, I'm speaking for myself here, can't speak for the whole committee, but the fact that there's four million pounds that was sent to the GPs, and we can't really trace what was actually done with that money. How did that? Uh, how? What actually? How we were able to? There's no audit trail effectively for us, and that's always a concern for us. It's a concern for you within the board as well. Jim Grant. There are processes in place to, to track the expenditure in, in terms of what has gone to GP practices. And there is also uh, various fora where, where uh, our primary care colleagues um, work with um, GPs to ensure that the, the, there is appropriate uh, checks and balances in place. Um, so, so there is a mechanism whereby, through our primary care team, that they look at uh, the, the, the finance that is allocated to, to GPs. So it isn't quite a kind of um, as, as invisible as, as you might imagine, but, it, but the independent contractor setup is, is certainly one that is complex, and we have a, a team who work closely with our GP colleagues in a constructive way to ensure that the service provision across Glasgow and Clyde is adequate, and that where there are genuine resource uh, requirements, that we are trying to support our primary care colleagues who, who are really, really important in the whole system of, of uh, service provision. Sure, just to follow up on that in a more practical sense, uh, is there a process in place to, for us to be able to measure the workload of GPs during the pandemic? And uh, how, if there is, how does that compare to pre COVID levels? So in terms of GP activity, it's, it's, uh, that, that uh, is, is part of the new GMS contract to be able to measure workloads within GP. Practices, but our partnerships work closely, and our chief officers with their local GP colleagues. We also have a deputy uh, uh, medical director who's who's a, a GP, practicing GP, and so we work closely with them to see what the additionality is, and we agree with them in terms of service provision what that needs to look like, and therefore the resource should follow. So um, we certainly are working with them, but, but in terms of number of patients they've seen and so on, that is part of the whole new GMS contract. The contracting setup is different for, for GPs than, than it is in the acute sector, which is clearly a different environment altogether. Okay, so we, we're not aware whether they're busier or uh, not busier than they were pre-COVID, or we, are, we, are we aware of what the GPs are doing as a a highly paid subcontractor to the board. So certainly, uh, they, they, we have set up the, the community assessment centres and the GP hubs, and GPs have been supporting those processes. So they've had to augment their change their ways of working as well around their, their normal GP practice, but also helping us in the community hubs and in the GP hubs. So they have done significantly additional work in to on top of their normal day job in a different way. So they have actually supported very well actually the whole system across Glasgow and Clyde, because had we not had the community assessment centres and the GP hubs and so on, we would not have been able to separate those um, COVID and non-COVID pathways. So they have done a huge amount in addition to their normal activity. Um, so they're probably their base activity, if I could call it that, is, is perhaps a little less because those additional patients have gone through community assessment centres and the GP hub. Um, but they have certainly done, uh, like, like the acute sector, they have augmented their service provision in a different way. 
and also they have embraced the, the telephone consultation and, and virtual consultation. So I think their service provision has had to amend in light of COVID in the same way as the acute sector has. Okay, sure. finally, I, I just finally I just want to ask. Uh, you know, we all get very excited when we're doing the inquiry uh, about primary care, about various ways of delivering service and new ideas and uh, everything else. And no doubt you are yourselves. Uh, so my question would be: Has COVID nineteen resulted in more care being undertaken by by primary care professionals other than GPs? Because that was one of the things that came up during our inquiry: was there may be a better way of being able to do things. So, so there are a variety of areas within practices um, through the primary care improvement plans um, where that multidisciplinary uh, team is augmented. Um, that was ongoing before the pandemic and has continued through the pandemic. We also have in GP out of hours, um, we are augmenting the teams of uh, uh, nurse, uh, nurse, advanced nurse practitioners um, and also we are looking at AHPs and so on to support the work of GPs in a different way, that has we have been out to recruitment in recent days for for some of those uh, uh, individuals to support GP out of hours, and we're also looking at pharmacy colleagues within uh, GP practices to actually um, look at how we can support um, drug uh, queries along with things like mental health assessment. So there is a lot of work going on in that arena across both the GP in hours and GP out of hours. And a brief supplementary from Emma Harbour. Thank you, convener, for taking this up. But it is just a quick question for Jane. Um, with the community hubs and the GP hubs and this alternate working, moving from acute care to primary care, are you measuring how that has reduced emergency room visits during the, the pandemic? Jane Grant. So we have seen a reduction in the emergency attendances at uh, ED departments. Um, they are now back to, uh, in Glasgow and Clyde, about 80 per cent of what they were um, before. Um, however, we also have patients, as you say, going through the community assessment centres, and we also have some of them referred on to the, what we call SATA, which in essence is a COVID um, line within, within the acute sector. So they are in addition to those emergency department processes. So the processes have been redesigned completely. So there, in terms of the counting mechanism, there are less um, Emergency department attendances, but there is that SATA pathway and the COVID hub um, um, processes which weren't in place before. Okay. Thank you very much. And I now call Donald Campbell. Thank you, Convener. Um, my questions are around the prospect of a second wave of the virus, which is clearly very difficult to predict. But I wonder if the panel can help me with this. What planning uh, has been put in place? to ensure that, as a board, you are able to deal with a surge in cases of COVID-19 uh, over the next six months, say? Jim Grant. So clearly, as part of our remobilization plan, we have been looking at what is absolutely urgent and making sure that we are um, making as much progress with urgent patients as we can, should there be a second spike. In, in, in uh, April, we had in, a, in, in excess of 600 inpatients at any one time, and that was a significant proportion of uh, patients within the, the, the acute sector at that time. And we also had to, as you know, um, double and triple our ITU capacity. So the big challenge for us would be if, if ITU capacity, which is normally at 45 beds, um, and we got to um, almost 80 patients, but, but at some points we thought there might be more than that. So we were planning for an additional part, um, aspect of that. So what, what, what we're doing just now is looking at what are the options to ensure that our urgent patients do not wait a long time. So we're in a good position going into any further pan, uh, uh, if there was a second spike. And also we're looking at how we augment the normal winter plan, if I could call it that, with also the, the need to, to really put a lot of effort into flu vaccination to reduce the, the, the kind of routine winter additionality in terms of emergency flow. And those plans um, are, are uh, underway just now to make sure that we can support urgent and emergency patients in a positive way to make sure the, the delays are minimised, but also should there be a second spike, that we would go into that um, with some of the pathways m much better defined than they were the last time, because clearly we need to use our anaesthetic colleagues to support ITU, which is the big challenge for um, continuing with elective work. And our theatre staff 
um, have all been trained to, to support ITU should they need to do that again. But that would obviously impact on our elective work, so therefore we need to make sure that urgent patients um, um, have been addressed in that clinical prioritisation that I talked about earlier. Well, we'll come. Thank you. I mean, you. You covered my next question, I think, in, in, in your answers. But just to be sure, can you confirm that uh, you are taking steps to ensure that some clinical activity can continue, should there be a yeah. second spike? Absolutely, we are, um, because we need to make sure that our uh, emergency and urgent patients um, have access to healthcare when they need it, and those are um, absolutely centre stage in our planning. Okay. And, and on this issue, and the convener asked you several questions about testing, and I just wondered if I could pursue that a little further, given, given its importance should, should a second spike uh, occur. Um, can you confirm approximately how many tests per day as a board uh, you're carrying out, and what is the, the actual capacity? Yeah. So we're we are currently processing within the labs um, about just under 10,000, uh, uh, approximately between nine and 10,000 uh, a day, um, and uh, we are now moving a, a, th a thousand uh, patients from care homes into that NHS lab processing as well. And we can we can probably do another four or five thousand patients at the moment, and we're just finalising whether we can do that or not. So we have got some spare capacity, and we will be moving additional care home work into the NHS. But we do need to keep some spare capacity should there be additional requirements going into the winter. Thank you very much. C can I turn now to a separate issue, which is the um, the issue of the, the NHS workforce? Um, could you uh, detail for us what impact has the recent increase in cases uh, of COVID-19, uh, what is the impact of that on staffing levels? Have you, for instance, seen an increase in, in absences? So at the, at the peak of the pandemic, when we had a lot, we had a lot of staff off, we had almost 2,000 staff off, um, uh, with in excess of 1,000 a, a of them shielding. Most of them have now returned. At the moment, we've got just over 300 people off, and um, so we're in a much better position than we were when we had those shielding patients. Um, uh, sorry, shielding staff. My apologies. Um, and so we're in a reasonably positive position um, at the moment. Uh, we have been augmenting our staff with some additional staff to make sure that we have got um, staff available should there be a second peak or should there be. Um, winter pressures, so we are looking at augmenting that just now, but at the moment we are in a, a better position than we have been prior to that. In terms of the overall sickness, our overall um, sickness was, uh, was slightly improved um, during the COVID pandemic, uh, but we also had, uh, for, our, for our, what I would call routine sickness, if you know what I mean, as opposed to the COVID sickness or absence. So, so we, had, we have seen um, it relatively stable, the, the routine sickness, if I could call it that, as opposed to the, the COVID additionality um, absence. Okay. Given, given those, those comments, could you explain, or is it, is it easy to measure the impact that that has had on the delivery of services in the last six months? Doing good. So it is quite hard to measure because what we did have is we had a number of people off shielding, and we also had to redeploy a lot of staff into different roles. So when we're redeploying and we have that absence, it's quite difficult to to measure in that in that kind of binary way what the, because there was a number of factors, a very significant number of factors that impacted on our ability to to deliver services. Um, however, clearly the shielding part of that was substantial, and while we had some people who could work at home, there was also clearly some of our clinical staff who were unable to do that. So it certainly had an impact. Um, we are augmenting our virtual processes to, to ensure that we're maximising our potential to work at home or out with the, the clinical facilities, but that has a that that clearly has a limit to its uh, uh, appropriateness. Go on. My final question, again, you've touched on this in some of your answers, is about workforce planning going forward. And you, you talked about augmenting the staff. Um, could you describe any more general workforce planning that's taken place to ensure the board has a, has a flexible workforce uh, to respond to any increase in cases that we might see over the next six months? Doing 
we are looking at um, our uh, at base staffing to make sure that those areas where we anticipate increased challenges have been resourced appropriately. We are looking at uh, increasing our test protect workforce to make sure we can respond to the tracing requirements. And we are looking to augment our, our, our staff banks to make sure that should there be a, a need for flexibility. Um, and we have also taken on a significant amount of the, the students who have just graduated from universities to make sure that we have got adequate staffing in place going into the winter. Thank you very much. And can I thank Jane Grant and Mark White from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde for uh, their very full answers to our questions. There may be uh, one or two remaining questions which we will uh, uh, send you in writing after this meeting. But uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation today. We now move on to thank the. Uh, thank you very much. We now move on to the uh, second panel in relation to pre-budget scrutiny, which is. Uh, representing NHS Lothian. And can I welcome to the committee Callum Campbell, the Interim Chief Executive of NHS Lothian, and Susan Goldsmith, the Director of Finance. As with uh, the previous panel, we'll take questions in a more or less pre-arranged order, uh, and we'll endeavour to uh, uh, get the, the full range of questions asked uh, in the time that we have. Uh, and I will start, uh, as I did, uh, with the other panel by asking for a general uh, picture from Callum Campbell and Susan Goldsmith on, on balance uh, how far they would, you would expect additional costs from COVID-19 to be offset by the reductions in expenditure elsewhere, uh, what additional costs you anticipate over the full financial year, and to what extent you expect the Scottish Government to provide funding uh, to meet the additional costs. And can I start with Callum Campbell? Yeah, thank you, convener. I'll give a very brief introduction, and then Susan will give you some detail behind it. I think, similar to Glasgow, we are seeing additional costs coming through with very little that we can offset. I think in the early stage of the pandemic, we had to stand up our ITUs. We had to bring in additional staff, significant costs around PPE, and we're now seeing activity returning to normal but we're still having to deal with the pandemic. I think maybe Susan will give some figures behind it. Susan Goldsmith. Okay, thank you, Convener. Yes, we are, we've been working very closely with colleagues across uh, the finance community to, to make an assessment of the, the costs of COVID. So, for example, within Lothian, at, um, for July's results, we reported an overspend of 27 million. 38 of that related to what we would have accounted for as COVID costs, with an offset of just under 15 million. Uh, so we've, what we've been doing is we've been working to make an assessment of the, the year-end position uh, for the board. And our assessment, which we're still working on, but the, the initial um, submission that we made to Scottish Government colleagues was that that our cost would be about 119 million by the, the end of the year. Now, that does not include social care. We are just revisiting that at, <coughs> at the moment. Um, and um, On the back of that, working with Scottish Government colleagues to agree how the resources, the additional resources that have been made available to Scottish Government will be distributed um, across the health boards. Thank you very much. Uh, we heard from Mark White that there was currently a review of how that money should be distributed. To, uh, Susan Goldsmith. Are you able to tell us any more about that? Clearly, uh, these are costs which are uh, real spend rather than estimated, uh, uh, estimated or formula-based costs in the way that perhaps most revenue funding is allocated. What, what is the difference in approach here, and how quickly do you anticipate agreement being reached on what the, what the basis for that should be, and what are the implications of that for Lothian? Susan Goldsmith. So, so normally, as you know, most uh, the, the most resources come through the the NRAC formula, um, but we recognised early on across the finance community that that might not necessarily be appropriate because different boards have had um, a different experience of changes to their post cost profiles. So, what we've been doing is we've been working um, to try and make an assessment about 
where costs are driven by um, population size. So, for example, some of our capacity around um, uh, public health, which is um, test and protect, is very population driven. And others, um, it's the way in which uh, COVID hit um, boards. So, we saw a greater impact in uh, Lothian and, and um, Glasgow initially, and, and less impact at the further north you went. So, so at the moment, we haven't actually seen how the, the resource is going to be distributed, but I do know that there has been a lot of work to try and make sure that uh, allocations come out that do recognise not only the, the demographics of boards, but also the, how costs have been incurred across the system. But we are all working to on the basis that the costs we've incurred will actually be funded um, by Scottish Government. We, we, we naturally are trying to make sure that the costs that related to our original financial plan before um, before COVID uh, um, are delivered, you know, in a break-even position. But as Mark said, um, some of the areas that are in our normal financial plan, so the delivery of savings, have been compromised by COVID, and so we have included those in our overall assessment um, of the the costs for for the board. Thank you very much. Two, two further questions supplementary to that. First of all, I think can you confirm what I think they're saying, which is that it's agreed across the board, including by the government, that NRAC is not the appropriate basis for uh, meeting the costs incurred during COVID. It's not so much that NRAC is not appropriate; it's just that it, that it won't be solely distributed on an NRAC basis. Um, so we're trying to get a mixed model that recognises some costs are. Driven by population, and an NRAC is appropriate, but others are not. So it will be a mixed model of distribution of resource. And thank you very much. And, and my final question in this territory is in relation to the projection, because it's, if I've noted the numbers correctly, uh, Glasgow and Lothian are both projecting uh, uh, COVID costs in the in the region of 190 million. Perhaps given the Difference in population size that might be quite surprising. Uh, is, is that have I understood that correctly? And is it surprising from your point of view, Susan Goldsmith? I, I think I suppose if you you know three or four months ago before we started this, I, I wouldn't have anticipated the cost of being so significant. Um, but um, We've had, as, as Callum said, and, and both Jane and, and Mark have said before, we had to create additional capacity. We had to bring in additional staff to make sure that um, staff absences could be covered. Um, we've had to enhance our, our cleaning. We've had to inc uh, enhance our portering services. We brought in additional student nurses. So when you, you look at all the um, things we've put in place, then the, the, the additional costs are perhaps less surprising. Um, one, the, the thing that we've both included, though, are the costs of remobilisation. So it isn't that the 119 million for Lothian is not just the cost of COVID. It's also recognising that uh, for some time we've not been able to carry out our scheduled programme of work, um, both um, you know, inpatient day case, outpatient, some of our diagnostics. Uh, work and so the estimated costs for the year include provision for trying to recover some of that activity. Now we, we may not be able to source the capacity. Certainly in Lothian, we would struggle to support, source that capacity. So we would have to look to the independent sector and whether that will be available to us or not. So some of those costs in the remobilisation are based on assumptions and estimates of what we think we would need to do to, to get services back up and running. Thank you very much. I now call Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested in some issues around uh, the longer term implications of COVID-19. and um, We've heard other uh, panels uh, in, in previous committees, as, uh, previous uh, evidence sessions as well, talk about how the pandemic has led to changes in the way that service delivery is made. And uh, so, I guess my question would be: um, the coronavirus has led to changes in service delivery. So, will you uh, be implementing those changes in a more long-term way? And I suppose if that is the case, 
um, will the long-term changes result in additional costs requiring more funding for future years? Come, come. Well, it's a good question, and I'm not trying to duck it. The answer is both. The benefits we've had around things like near me or call me, which is a virtual way of dealing with people with minor injuries, I think has got capacity to reduce costs over time and reduce demand. I think, however, the, some of the guidance we're getting around infection control, the Four Nations guidance, if we have to continue with that over time, that will put a significant pressure on space. There's a two-metre spacing requirement. That will reduce beds that will have to be replaced elsewhere. That spreads staff more thinly to create more rewards, and that's going to bring additional costs. So I think the challenge is to try and keep all those things that we believe will give us benefit, more efficiency, and we need to try and mitigate any of the impacts or risks as best we possibly can. Emma Harper. So, Susan, Susan is going to elaborate. Susan Goldsmith. I just wanted to add, it's, it is very uh, difficult to, to answer that question um, um, because we're still working on it. And Callum's right that there will be some there are areas where there's additional cost and some where there, there might be some financial benefits. The, the point I wanted to make is that whatever we do, we need to, given that we are going to be changing the way some services are delivered, we need firstly to invest and build up the infrastructure and new services before we will see the, the release of resources and in, in services that we're currently delivering. So, so I think that the answer to the question is initially there will be additional cost um, as we build up that new infrastructure. Over time, we might see some um, benefit from a reduction in services that are, are now provided in a different way. But, but the, the thing is about the bridging from where we are now uh, to the future model that's important. Emma. Okay, so uh, one of the goals is to shift the balance of care so that uh, care is delivered in more <clears throat> community settings rather than acute settings. And with uh, coronavirus, we've seen that uh, with the use of Near Me and the digital technology and community hubs and GP hubs, as we've heard, means that we are able to start moving things out to other areas away from acute hospitals like phlebotomy clinics, for instance, as well. So, um, would you see that that would just incur more cost, or would that shift um, the, 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 I guess, the, the budget required from acute care to now that's more than a community-supported um, aspect? Colin Campbell. Yeah, yeah. It depends. And I'm not trying to be clever. It depends how you calculate the cost. Certainly to the individual, the patient, the closer you can provide care to home to them, the less cost, whether that's travel or time, is to them. And I think the focus should be on providing the most appropriate care in the most appropriate place, place when we can, whether that be the acute sector or not. The one concern I have around the shifting of balance of care debate, and I'm not sure, Emma, if that's where you're coming from, is people perceive that there is an ability to significantly reduce the secondary care sector to shift that resource to the primary care or community care sector. And I do not share that view. I have not seen the evidence that suggests we could operate with significantly less beds. What I would fully sign up to is the fact that we should do as much care as close to home as possible, provided it is clinically safe to do, and not Proportionally advantage or disadvantage either side. Emma Harper. Okay, no, thanks for clarifying that, Callum. Um, when we often talk about funding for the integration joint boards, um, set aside budget comes up as well. So, have you been able to make any assessment on whether the set aside budgets will be impacted at all? Come on, come. So, I'm going to get to Susan. And, and, and what I would say is, and my apologies, I'm relatively new in Lothian, so I'm reflecting upon my Lanarkshire experience and my more recent experience in Lothian. 
We have been dealing with this as a crisis. In well, finance is important. Certainly, my experience in Lanarkshire and in Lothian, as the chief officers have been together with myself and other senior directors and said, what is the right thing to do? And I am not saying money is not important, but it has been a secondary concern at these times to get the best possible response. I do not know about the impact on the set aside, Susan, if you want to elaborate. Susan Gross. Certainly, the, the set aside will be impacted. Um, over the COVID period, we saw a reduction in the number of emergency admissions. Um, and so, if we were operating the set aside um, based on activity, so we were charging the IGBs, so to speak, for the for the activity um, through unscheduled care, then yes, there would be a reduction um, in cost. Although the infrastructure costs to the board are still the same. Um, as Callum said, though, we, we haven't really operated in, in that way. We, we've operated as a single system, trying to make our best assessment of um, what's the right thing to do in the current environment and to agree the, the cost profile of that, um, of whatever we're having to put in place without actually being too concerned about the impact on set aside. As, as we try to remobilise services and, and to think about different ways of delivering service, so for example, the work on scheduling of uh, urgent care or unscheduled care will actually have an impact on the, the calculation of the set aside budget. But that would really be about rebasing um, our budgets across the system, and that's something that we will start to look at in more detail as we move through the autumn and start to plan for uh, next year. Beyond. Emma Okay, and um, thanks. I mean, what we're seeing and what you're describing is that the response to the pandemic has been to be adaptable, to, to make changes rapidly, to just get on with the job and not really focus on the finances. And uh, and do you think that that should be something that should be a model going forward, where basically you know? Just not have the minutia of every penny being looked at. It's it's dead. We heard also that um, um, COPD uh, outpatient uh, pulmonary rehab. The money was used for, from a prescribing budget rather than other budgets. So would it be easier just to say let you get on with it? I'll I'll maybe answer Emma if it's okay before my director of finance. Fix me. Uh, I, I think in an ideal world, I would I would love that to be the the, the case. The, the reality, however, we can't duck the fact that the health service is such a large part of the Scottish budget that you would you would expect us to manage it, manage as efficiently as we can, and be as detailed as we possibly can to make sure there's as little waste in the system and we maximise the return from the money we get from taxation. So I think we have to not put unnecessary bureaucracy in place, but we do have to make sure we account for what we do in order we can answer the question of that we're delivering the best we can within the resources available to us. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Um, no, um, uh, that's fine, convener. I think that was my final question, unless okay. Susan wants to add in. <laughs> No, I I could only confirm what Callum said. I I I am as a director of finance. I think the you know looking after the money is is obviously very important for us. But also we do need to be flexible, and I think that is what we're trying to do is to be flexible, but but also to try and make sure that as we you know deliver different you know different models that we're actually making the best use of um, taxpayers' resources. So. I'm afraid the money is always <laughs> important. Thank you very much, George Adam. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Callum and, and Susan. I would just like to follow on if you maybe have heard the previous session asked about how the integration of health and social care had worked now during the pandemic. We heard ourselves, we've heard from some of your colleagues from other places where it's that COVID nineteen's actually helped with Integration and uh, broken down barriers and communication zones. Has that been the case with yourselves? Come, come. Yeah. 
Sorry, thank you. Thank you. I, I think any crisis brings people together if they've got positive intentions, and I think certainly Lanarkshire and in Lothian, I've been certainly impressed the way the chief officers have engaged with me to say how do you do the right thing for the right reasons. So I think that's a benefit that's come out of this this crisis. I think the integration is a, a journey, and I don't think it's something that started with the pandemic. I think we'd both in Lanarkshire and Lothian we'd started it long before that. It's brought us some advantages, and certainly the conversation. I'm reflecting a conversation earlier this week. We are trying to be as respectful as we can. Each of the IGBs can be different, but we're also now having a very sensible conversation about where we can standardise, where we can reduce variation. That's a good thing to do, and that's a lot easier to explain across the system. So I think we're on an integration journey. I don't think this will be the end of it, but hopefully we'll take lessons from it. Georgia. Thank you for that, Callum. Uh, what I would probably want to ask there is, uh, you know, have the health boards and integration authorities? You've said there you, you're working in a kind of IGB to IGB level. But obviously, you're working with IGBs. You're also working with local authorities as well uh, to cover uh, health and social care. So, have you been able to work effectively to ensure prompt action? And effective, and effective decision making, and I mean, actually being able for the man or woman in the street to actually say, "I went in with an issue; it was able to be dealt with," as opposed to all the kind of various structures that you would have yourself. I know the structures need to be there. I just want to know that it helps with delivery of service. So, the honest answer I would like to say yes, George, but you would have to ask the the public the, the question. I think the examples I would give you that evidence my yes would be the rapid pace with which we created, set up, and developed the COVID pathways that required the health board, the local authorities, and the IGBs to to work together. The collaboration we're seeing around the the care homes uh, has been good. It's been innovative, but it's been a major challenge we've had to address. And some of the planning we're putting in around. The universities coming back, planning for the flu campaign, and hopefully also planning for a COVID uh, vaccine. I think are all examples of fear. The local authority, the health board, the IGBs, and sometimes other partners have worked together. Georgia. Thank you, convener. Thanks for that, Callum. The experience of the pandemic has it has it actually highlighted to to you any. Areas of improvement and and the structures that you have in place and decision making processes. Has there been anything? Is there an example you can give me uh, that where you say you know this has made a big difference and we've changed dramatically and we will continue to work this way? Come, come. So, so I would like to answer positively, but I would have to say that. The relationships that I've had have always enabled me to have direct access to whether it's the chief officers, the council chief execs, and if there's been issues, we've always been able to move them. I think the pandemic's brought it into stark focus, but uh, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is at the end of the pandemic, was the structure the best structure for us to have in over? In order to respond to such a crisis, and I think we have to do that as part of the lessons learned review as a result of this. Georgia. No, thank you, convener. That's all. Thanks. Thanks very much. We'll now move on uh, to Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning uh, to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm interested around the. Indirect health impacts, if you like, from uh, from the pandemic. Um, we know there was pressure pre-pandemic on mental health, on chronic pain and diabetes, you know, cancer screening, COPD, you know, heart conditions, uh, which has only been massively exacerbated by uh, the current crisis. Um, so, what assessments have been made uh, of the potential uh, indirect health impacts of COVID-19? And, and the inevitable train that's coming down the track uh, of, the, of those pressures are not going to go away. Um, 
how, how are you how are you managing that 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 sort of uh, that assessment at the moment? Yeah, and again, I'll let Susan come in if she wants to add to it. But the history of loading is the fact that we didn't have enough capacity to meet our demand prior to the pandemic, and that's why we had our waiting times challenges. Now, the pandemic's brought that into really sharp focus, and we are constantly monitoring the build-up or the backlog that we're going to have, and that's going to be a significant challenge for us going forward. The reassurance I can give you is the fact that we are using a national prioritisation process based on clinical need, but there will be a significant backlog that is going to take us a significant amount of time to, to address and clear, but we have to stick to try and do the right thing, do it by clinical priority, and get back to the point Emma Harper made. If we can do things out of hospital, do them elsewhere, let's do that there. But we have a real concern about our capacity to meet the demand. I don't know, Susan, if you want to elaborate. Susan Goldsmith. Yes, yeah, so I would. I would just add that um, absolutely for Lothian, with the the demographics that we have and the, and the growing population, what I see is is um, a, a continual requirement for investment in infrastructure. So we before COVID, we were. Full, you know, every part of our system was full, and so through our um, capital investment program, we've got business cases coming forward for primary care to, to recognise the, the house building um, in Edinburgh and the Lothians to um, uh, the, the cancer centre. We're working on a business case for that, recognising again the, the demographics. We've got the elective and diagnostic centre that. It recognises that we need capacity in, the, in the elective care. So, so I, I do think that it, this will continually be a challenge for for loading. And now that we've got a significant backlog, we will need to access the independent sector for that as well. Can, can I ask then? Do you, do you think that uh, public expectation is being properly managed then? Because there's obviously going to be. A serious impact, certainly on elective surgery. I mean, we've heard that, that, that potentially that will rise to probably 50% or so. Um, are we managing the expectation properly? Alan Campbell. A good question. I think I think public expectations might be slightly different at the end of the pandemic. I'm given a perception of, I've had, which is the public always believed that hospitals were very, very safe places, and mm -hmm. while we've driven the patient safety agenda, it's, there's inherent risk in any sort of surgery, exposure to radiation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously, that's before you start talking about the organisms there. So, I, hopefully, we can start to have a sensible conversation about how we reduce demand. How we promote health rather than just cheat ill health, and that's been one of the positive things in through the pandemic. We are seeing more people exercising, cycling, etc. It may be good for the nation, but we are going to have to be honest and say the waiting times will be a real challenge to get back to. It will take us a significant amount of time, and the financial availability to support that, I would have thought, given the impact in the economy, is going to be limited. Can I just ask a very quick aside question? Just something you raised there. Where are you sitting around uh, hospital bed uh, occupancy compared to pre-COVID uh, 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 levels? So probably the best example I could give you is the fact that we saw a massive reduction in attendance in the A&E department at the start of the pandemic, and that. Down to so the Royal Infirmary would have an average 260, 270. It would maybe go up to about 330, 340, but you might have quiet days as well. Yesterday we had 407. So mm -hmm. the reality is the sector is under pressure already this winter. We have the most autumn going into winter, and we're going to have to plan for winter. So people have started to come back, but a lot of that is about. Urgent care that's maybe been some of the backlog that you're referring to, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask, 
do you think then uh, you know lockdown is uh, did we strike the right balance uh, between minimizing direct health impacts and the indirect health impacts given what you've just said there that there is this backlog that is that is not going to go away and you're inevitably going to have to deal with that at some point and we're we're looking at covid because it's right in front of us it's right in front of our face and we can measure that right here right now but this backlog coming down the road have we dealt with that well, I think it's an impossible question to answer, if I'm being honest with you. I think history will judge us. I think we can see it more than we moved in line with the national guidance. The evidence was limited at the time, and I don't think MD acted in bad faith. But I'm sure come the end of this, there will be lessons that we can learn and pick up. But I, I wouldn't want to criticise at this point. Yeah, I think just, just just, just to clarify, I'm, there's no criticism here in terms of, I think, I, I was just trying to grab a bit of reality here uh, around, you know, and, and look back at decisions that have been made and, and you know, uh, which were all made in, in good faith at the time and whether or not we can do things differently going forward. I think finally, I think what I would like to ask you is, is, is there a time scale to recovery uh, to sort of pre-COVID levels of, of, of performance or are we, as the reality is, we're unlikely ever to get there. Okay. So again, the, the timeline is very difficult. We thought we were coming out at the first peak. Mm. We thought there might be a second wave. There still might be a second wave. We're seeing a wee bit more mm. demand. And until mm. we've got a vaccine, how, how long is this going to go on, Brian? I really don't know. So it's, it's an impossible question to say how long it's going to last. With regards getting back to pre-COVID levels, I would suggest it's highly unlikely. One of the lessons that we're going to take from this is the importance of single rooms in hospitals. I'm conscious you had Glasgow on earlier on. You've got Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary. In Lothian, we've got a limited number of single rooms. I would be astounded if there's not an increased focus on single room accommodation, uh, because that's one of the things we have to take from this pandemic, that those with single rooms were much easier to cohort their patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, come on, David Thomas. panel, how has the demand on hospices been affected by the pandemic? Come, come. So, I'll maybe start the question by giving you a Lanarkshire example, but then I'm going to ask Susan Goldsmith to do it in a loathing sense. Certainly at the start of the pandemic in Lanarkshire, we saw a, a slight decrease, sorry, decrease in the demand for the hospices, and the Kilbride hospices were absolutely superb. They made their facilities available to NHS Lanarkshire. They were part of our surge response, and we used that through the, the, the rise of the first wave. I don't know if, Susan, you want to talk about Lothian's hospices? I would be able to, uh, not able to answer what the demand is like currently, but I know from a Lothian perspective that we um, agreed fundings to support the, the hospices of uh, £2 million, and, and that resource has been made available uh, to the hospices. Thank you very much, David Thomas. Thank you, Convener. Is it anticipated that following the reduction of plant care and diagnostic testing during the pandemic, future demand for hospices care will increase? And if so, how will this be funded? Alan Campbell. Okay, I'll, uh, it's a funding question, convener. If you're okay, I'll, I'll duck it and pass it to my director of finance. Yes, I mean through the through our financial planning process, we're always looking at future demand and and trying to make sure that we provide for future demand. And obviously, you know, the discussions and dialogue we have with with hospices um, have featured in that that financial planning process over many, many years. We work in partnership with our hospices. And, and if we are to see a future demand in hospices, then, then it's in the interests of our, our wider system that, that we work with the hospices to make sure that they have the right capacity in place for that demand. We will continue to, do, to work with them over the, 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 you know, the coming years if, if that comes to pass. David Thomas. 
And my final question, Convener, what other services commissioned by the IGBs have received increased funding as a result of the pandemic? Is it anticipated that this extra funding will need it to be continued? Uh, Susan Goldsmith. No, we have we have transferred uh, funding over to the the integration joint boards for for social care and indeed for primary care and for hospice funding. Um, we are working with the the IGBs, particularly around the assessment of the impact on social care, um, and we do understand that there will be further funding coming. Um, so as part of our wider assessment of the, the resource impact, so not just on the board, but on social care, um, whether that how that translates into the future again is, is part of what does do, do the future models of care look like and what capacity is required across the system. Um, and we work with our IGBs through the financial planning process on that. Very much. Sandra White. Morning, witnesses. I just wanted to follow up on similar questions I asked to Greater Glasgow Health Board in regards to the new technologies and the innovation. Um, can you tell me what new innovations that uh, you have used yourself in regards during the lockdown and whether these will be retained or will they be extended after COVID-19? Alan Campbell. So, yes, we have used near me, and I think that's got great potential. I think an example I would specifically give that I was discussing yesterday was could we use it increasingly in nursing homes? Because as people get into nursing homes, we really want to try and maintain there if we can, instead of bringing them in and out of the acute sector if we can. But I think all clinical services have got an opportunity to use that. Increasingly using remote monitoring, again, reduces the need for some patients to have to come to hospital. Uh, the biggest one I would use, though, is Microsoft Teams. We've seen a transformation of our corporate services, the way, we've had, the way they've had to operate throughout this period. Our payroll, our HR, our finance, large sections of that throughout the period have been working from home. And that's been a revelation that if you'd asked me six, nine months ago, is that possible? I would have said no. One of the things I do as well as this job, as I chair the Scottish Terms and Conditions Committee as the employer chair. And I know staff side colleagues are keen to have conversations about what that means about home working policies, etc. And I think that is something that is going to come out of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's very interesting and it is useful, obviously. Uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde mentioned about the calling with doctors, etc., and also obviously health boards, IGBs as, as well. Have you explored that type of, in your um, new technology innovations? Is this the consultant connect between the consultants and the GPs you are referring to? Yes, yes. But yet, so, yes. You use that as well. That is great. So, well, you use this and obviously. A lot of the innovations has been on the staff side of it, uh, basically. Have you found um, any barriers during that type of thing, even the digital care, or any way that to, the infrastructure has it been great? Is it broken down, or has it been working all right and it will it expand? So, yes, is a challenge. Anything new brings about challenges, and some of us aren't getting younger. So we are sometimes dependent upon others to help us set up the technology. I would come back on you, Sandra, in the point earlier on, and say I think the examples we've had in Lothian have been as much clinical as for corporate staff. So I just particularly focused on the corporate staff example. I think one of the biggest barriers. And I think all health boards will have to think about that is we are going to have to spend more money on our uh, information technology teams, technology, and we also have to be very careful around digital exclusion. Mm -hmm. so as we invest in the health service, we have to be aware that we don't drive inequalities in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. 
completely. Um, you mentioned earlier on about in your previous, obviously, your, your chief of the uh, Lanarkshire, wasn't it? The NHS, basically. You mentioned earlier that you could always contact, uh, you know, local councils, etc., chief execs, that type of thing. Are you going to look at evaluating the patient's experience from this new technology? Will you produce a paper, or will you ask patients how they've felt about it? Absolutely. It's not a convenient. Absolutely. And certainly the evaluation will have to be more than just at a loading level. I think we should be looking at this nationally. You are going to expect it to be as efficient as possible. And if you're going to use technology, you're better using it on a regional or a national scale to derive the biggest benefits, to give us as much uh, flexibility as standardisation as we can. But it's not confusing for patients moving between health boards. But happy to share all our feedback on that. That's good. That's a good point. And uh, last question, uh, convener, uh, just on the same theme. Uh, basically, the interventions we're talking about with the new technology. Will you be evaluating that as well, making an assessment on the value that's brought, not just to obviously the patients, but to uh, the health board as well? Colin Campbell. Yeah, I think Susan's probably best place to answer that. Susan Goldsmith. Um, and one of the things that we're absolutely clear about is that um, the case, every case that comes forward for further investment, um, defines the, the the benefit. So we've just considered a, a case, for example, um, from children's services where. Uh, community uh, nurses who work in children's services, and um, how much more efficient they can be by not having to keep going back to base and to health centres um, to to log into a machine there. So, so absolutely, every single case will have different benefits, either in terms of um, reduced travel, more patients, and also we'll have to do some qualitative assessment as well. So, yes, is the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call Donald Cameron. Thank you, Convener. Um, my questions are about uh, a second wave of the virus, potential second wave, which is, of course, very difficult to predict, but I think is on all of our minds. Um, and can I ask what planning NHS Lothian has put in place to ensure that the, the board would be able to deal with a future increase in cases of COVID-19? Yes, certainly. The, the lessons from the first response, especially around uh, doubling and tripling our ITU capacity, are sitting there in place. Pardon me. We've got the benefit now from the National Clinical Prioritisation Tool. We will continue to see our urgent patients. I think our communications to the public, their understanding of the disease, the things we have to do to try and mitigate it, are there. And I think the other thing that we're doing is putting a significant focus on trying to schedule some of our unscheduled care. And I gave an example earlier on of us using Call Mia, which is a video platform for minor injuries. But all these things are ready to roll out should we have a second wave. Okay. Thank you for that. I think you you answered this partially by saying, um, you know, by detailing what you're doing in terms of um, ensuring other clinical activity uh, can continue. Can you just confirm that that's the case? That that if there are urgent cases or elective cases, that that you do have a plan in place to to deal with those, notwithstanding a second surge. Uh, of course, uh, our capacity will be stretched. I would expect so that we would have to use the clinical prioritisation tool to make sure that urgents and cancer cases, eh, we try to keep them going, but it will be based on clinical priority. Thank you very much. Uh, Donald Cameron, did you have another question? I've just got one more one more question, convener, which is around testing. Um, obviously, this is much in the news at the moment, but as a board, could you clarify um, uh, w w what you're doing in respect to testing. I'm particularly interested in how many tests per day uh, you're carrying out as a board, and what's your testing capacity, please? Um, 
So we've en enhanced our labs. Our labs are operating seven days a week on extended hours. A relatively small team. We've got approximately 3,300 tests, tests a day that we can do. We weren't at that capacity. So what we're doing now is we're doing a thousand tests for the care homes to take some of the pressure off there, but that will not be sustainable if we continue to see the rise in activity in the acute sector. But we're certainly offering it out in the short term. Thank you very much. I now call David Stewart. And good morning to our uh, witnesses. I have a few questions about uh, delayed discharge. Um, would the witnesses agree with the Lessons Learned report that during the pandemic, and I quote, uh, medical staff were leaving social decisions to social care teams, and it wa was it this aspect which led to a reduction in delayed discharge? Um, so I think that's that should be what happens anyway. The clinical staff should assess if somebody is clinically fit. And the social care staff should engage with the patient, their family, to work out the most appropriate setting for the person to go to, with the preference being, if at all possible, back to their home. So I'm not too sure I would agree that that's the magic bullet to address the challenge we've had around delayed discharges. David Stewart. Um, could I thank uh, Callan Campbell for that answer? How can reduced delayed discharge levels be sustained moving forward, and is ingrained behaviour uh, as important as finance? So, one of the positives of the pandemic has been that we have seen a significant reduction in delayed discharges. They are rising a wee bit just now, which is a bit of a concern. And what we need to try and do is get a balance between the capacity in the acute sector, the capacity in nursing homes, residential homes, and care at home. That's got to be the answer here. So I think finance is an issue, but we need to right size the capacity in each of those areas. David Stewart. And have you assessed the cost benefits of reducing delayed discharge? Okay. Susan, do you want to speak about cost benefit? I, I, I would just confirm, obviously, what Mark said earlier that clearly, if you just look at uh, the cost of care, comparing acute hospital services to care at home or care in the community, there is a significant cost differential. Um, I think Mark referred to about a quarter of the cost, and that that's that's about right. Um, however, we do try to make sure that um, the discussions about the balance of care are not driven by by cost, um, and it is it is important that we make sure we have the right capacity in, in the right place. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, further questions from a number of members. Can I encourage members to? Uh, be succinct and focused. Oh, David Stewart, I think, still has. Yeah. A, a it's a, it's a, it's a, thank you, Convener. Uh, the final area um, I want to look at is about health inequalities. And then I noted you had a recent board paper about that subject. What work has been undertaken to evaluate the impact of decisions taken during the pandemic on health inequalities? Alan Campbell. So I think it's a bit early to give a definitive answer, David. I think the focus and the drive behind your question is 100 per cent right. And what we are going to try and do with all our board papers, and certainly as we look at our service models, is to look at it through the lens of health inequalities and can we do anything to reduce this? Because I think one of the concerns that many of us have, and it reflects a question I asked earlier on, is, is history going to judge us badly? Over this, and have we potentially made health inequalities greater? And I think we need to take that as an acceptable question and see what we can do about it. David Stewart. And, and my final question, convener, and I think the chief executive has partially covered this. I mean, what consideration has been given to addressing health inequalities in the remobilisation plan? Come on, come on. 
Yes, the remobilisation plan will try to do much of what I've said earlier on. One of the things we will have to look at is any new models of service that we've got, and is there any unintended consequences of that? And that point around digital exclusion is a really good example. The other example I would give you is if you do have access to digital, we could do something about transportation. So we will have to look at everything in the round and see what's the best balance that we can find. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now want to go back to Emma Harper. Oh, Emma Harper. Um, thank you, convener. It was a supplementary before I ask my uh, final questions about mental health and CAMS, but the, it's a follow-up to Brian Whittle about uh, restarting total hip and total knee replacement procedures. Um, for example, they are like they are now um, obviously there's additional planning and organising and knee requirements. Single beds is a particular um, great example of what works really well when restarting hip and knee replacements. But how how will you get on top of that backload and will there be significant um, impact or increase in costs for restarting elective orthopaedic surgery? And I, I say this, I remind colleagues that in my uh, former uh, work I was a perioperative nurse and orthopaedics was one of the favourite theatres that I wanted to work in. So I'm interested in the cost impacts of restarting the likes of elective total hip and total knee and then getting on top of the backlog? Yes. Elective surgery, even a significant surgery like total knee, total hip, are not emergencies. However, if you're suffering from severe pain, it's affecting your life, it's a it's of crucial importance to you. We need to try and find pathways that keep that as green as possible. And we were struggling before this with our capacity. But it's back to the point that Susan Goldsmith made earlier on. We will have to look to see if we can work with the independent sector to see if we can get some of this capacity, because we'll accept they're not majorly clinically urgent. The impact on these on somebody's life can be absolutely massive. We need to find a solution to it, and I think it's going to come at an increased cost. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess it's something for it to think about following up as far as uh, you know, helping support people to have uh, pain managed appropriately. But mobility is obviously crucial for people who are waiting for hip and knee replacements. Um, I'll move on now to a couple of questions about mental health and uh, ch child and adolescent mental health. We know that uh, services um, were available during the pandemic. Can you highlight what services have been available to children and young people with mental health problems during the pandemic, and then maybe um, what impact the COVID-19 has had on waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services? So, going into the pandemic, one of the areas of challenge for NHS Lothian was the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. But I'm repeating the odd word because I've got the headphones are giving me a bit of feedback. The response from the service has been that they've followed up many patients using technology and they've performed well in that area. Disappointingly, though, the waiting time is much greater than we would like. We are engaging with the service. We have invested over £3 million additionally into the CAM service to increase our capacity, and we are exploring why we can't use technology more to do some of the initial assessments, especially in light of the fact that there is not a guarantee that we won't have a second wave. But it's one of the key priorities of the board. But it's not an area of strength for us at this time. Emma Harper. And are you anticipating that there will be a increase in demand for mental health services, not just for children and adolescents, but across the the whole board? Um, and obviously the planning for that 
needs to be a, a part of work taken forward. Come, come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, our mental health service have been really good at helping us around Unscheduled Care. We have created a mental health hub and we are looking to see what more we can do with them. But we talk about areas of additional demand, mental health, both adult and child will be a significant pressure as a result of the impacts of COVID. Thank you very much. Emma Harper, do you have one more question? Yeah, just a final question, convener. Thank you. And it's, it's an update on the development of mental health assessment centres. You know, we're looking at community hub development and lots of other ways of engaging people using virtual technology, which has been really good for mental health. But can you provide an update on the uh, the development of mental health assessment centres. Okay. Yes, and in Edinburgh we've brought the mental health services together to try and make sure that any unscheduled mental health attendance can go there via NHS twenty four. We're creating a flow hub within NHS Lothian to direct staff to direct patients there. And we're also looking at and we have started doing it from our AD department. If somebody turns up with a mental health problem and there's not an associated physical health issue, such as an overdose, we're moving them across to the mental health assessment unit to try and give them the best possible care, take them away from the A&E department, which is really the best place for them. And we're going to try and see how we can share that model and contrast it with the Glasgow model. And we've started conversations with Lanarkshire as well to try and see if we can get the benefits of each other right across the central belt. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Ryan Purple. Thank you, Convener. I imagine one of the, just sort of almost following on from my, my previous question there around, uh, which is my, my, my pet topic, uh, is around uh, health prevention or, or preventative uh, measures that the, the health board can do. And you discussed that a, bit, a little bit earlier yourself about how we create uh, a, a service that is preventing people becoming uh, increasingly unhealthy. So, in the current climate, really, what, what steps can the, uh, is the board taking to support that, that population health and prevention, as I say, in light of the recent, uh, obviously, the pandemic? Well, come. So I think the immediate one I would suggest is the flu. We're talking about COVID just now. Flu is a massive killer every year, and to a degree, I think as a country, we've got a wee bit blasé about it. And I think all senior politicians, health service managers, clinicians have got a duty to make sure that that is communicated clearly to the population to say the biggest help they could give us this winter is to do that. We are also planning, obviously, for the COVID vaccine. But I think there has been lots of good stuff through the Scottish Parliament around smoking and alcohol. And I suppose I would put the feedback to the Scottish Parliament to say that is the help assistance we require to focus on health as much as ill health if we are going to make a real transformational change in the health of the population. Thank you. I think I think really the direction of travel. We all talk about the preventive health measures that can be taken. We talk about things like obesity and diabetes and whatnot. And, we, and, and I think more of the COVID has brought that into sharp focus. In that uh, the the, the uh, mortality rate and COVID has been very much linked to things like obesity and diabetes and, and, and other and other conditions. But do you think that, that the pandemic itself has taken away uh, sort of focus on that, if you like, and understandably so, obviously, because it's right in front of our face. Um, are we, as, as parliamentarians, as the health service, uh, uh, have, have we taken away uh, focus on, on that and that preventative agenda? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure is the honest answer. I think we should all reflect at the end of this where we went into as a nation. And I'm not too sure that we benchmark particularly well in a preventative health sense. And I think we need to reflect upon that. I think the 
the evidence suggests that the three biggest drivers around COVID are age, obesity, and then gender. And I think that covers a very large percentage of population. Mm-hmm. That has been a bit of motivation for people to do something about their health. I'm just not sure how we best sustain that. And I think that's one of the killer questions for us. How do we help those who have made lifestyle changes sustain them and we don't forget about how a difficult year this has been? Thanks, and I, I absolutely agree with with you with you there in that how do we how do we grab a hold of that that, that uh, the, the changes that have been made and, and make them sustainable? Um, so can I can I follow on with that a little bit? I think you know can I can I ask what your latest estimates of additional costs uh, for NH Loading uh, and the Health and Social Care Partnership um, are resulting from uh, the impact of COVID nineteen? Susan Goldsmith. I mean, I, I, for the the um, health and social care and, and local authority partnerships, we're still working through that at the moment. But but the estimate that we have um, submitted uh, during August was that we expected the the additional cost to be just about thirty seven thirty eight million pounds for uh, social care and and some elements of the partnership. We think that's possibly a bit of a, an underestimate. So uh, we're really looking at that at the moment and should conclude that piece of work um, in fact later this week. Thank you very much. And I now call uh, David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. What impact has COVID-19 had on existing workforce pressures? Callum Cunt. So the additional staff we've had to bring into NHS Lothian is around 1,100. They are predominantly nursing staff, domestics, and porters. And I think we'll have to wait and see how long this continues as to how we can sustain that. I follows on to my next question, Convener. Why has NHS Lowen had such a high temporary staff cost, and what action can be taken to reduce temporary staff costs? Come, come. I'll get Susan to give some detail on it. But some of the drivers in Lowen is historically we've struggled to recruit in certain areas, and therefore we've uh, had to bring in the agency, etc. But where we can get staff on a permanent basis who are appropriately qualified. That is the cheapest model for us to use. Some of the detail, I do not know if Susan is getting beyond that. Susan Yes, I, I, I would not necessarily see it as a, a negative thing. Um, we actually have a very successful bank where we bring in uh, people who want to work flexibly. Um, and so that has worked very well for us um, over a number of years, where we do have um, turnover, and because we're in a relatively sort of competitive um, market here in, in Lothian, where that, that that model has worked well for us, and it's also allowed us to minimise our use of agency uh, staffing. So I mean, clearly, it's best to have permanent staff and post wherever possible. But that that bank resource allows us to flex. It allows us to cover sickness and absence where we, we might have pockets of higher levels. So I think there are positives to to the temporary staffing that we have in place as well. Thank you very much, David Torrance. And my final question, convener: What steps have been taken to ensure that NHS Lothian has a flexible workforce? but be able to meet demand if there is a future increase in the COVID-19 admissions. So it's similar to the previous answer. We are having to increase our number of domestics. We are rapidly having to look at how we expand our testing and tracing capacity. And we are having to look at how we expand our labs capacity. And they are the key areas of workforce planning that we are going to have to take forward in the next six months. Thank you very much, and my thanks to both Callum Campbell and Susan Goldsmith for your evidence today. Uh, it's been very helpful. We, I'm sure we'll follow up with one or two further questions 
uh, uh, after the meeting. Uh, but thank you for your attendance today. Uh, the committee will now move into private session, so uh, we will resume now. we will resume on another platform in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I now suspend this meeting. Thank you very much.